Well, it is an honor to be with you all here uh, this morning. And uh, as James said, my name is Scott Lerwick, and I'm the Vice President of Institutional Advancement at Boise Bible College. And really, we are a college that serves churches uh, across the Pacific Northwest. And, and I include Utah in that. Just I know you're more Mountain West, but, but you're really still part of our section of, of churches. And I just want to ask you a question this morning. Did you know... <laughs> That west of the Rockies, the church is in desperate need of more uh, pastors. I know Zach preached on uh, Matthew 28 a few weeks ago. He was telling me about this before the service. And, and I just want to highlight, within our theological heritage of churches that are similar to Roy Christian, that, that we have 17 churches that currently don't have a, a guy like James leading. Someone who's preaching week in and week out. 17 churches. And those are all those, uh, those blue dots. And then the yellow dots are those who are... Uh, the pastors who are over the age of 60. So we are currently surveying all of these churches. All the, all the red dots are churches, and if there's a number in it, there's a cluster of them. And those churches that have someone over the age of 60, uh, guess what? There's current, well, this number's wrong because it just updated since we left. But on this slide, there's 41. There's actually 43 that we know of right now that are without, uh, that, that have pastors over the age of 60. And the average age there is 68. The oldest man who's out there preaching right now is 92. And what does this say? It, it tells me that in the next 10 years, probably less, man, there's going to be great need for more uh, preachers. There's going to be at least 60 positions that need to get filled. And that's where Boise Bible College comes in, because we really are uniquely positioned to meet this need, because our mission as a school is simply this, is that we want to glorify God by equipping servant leaders who build up the church to advance the gospel worldwide. Everything that we do revolves around this mission. We've been doing it not just for five years, but we've been after this, get this, for 77 years. And it's really out of this mission that we are recruiting more students, we're equipping them for ministry, and then we're deploying them to go make a kingdom impact, not only here locally, but also globally. And we do this in many ways, but I'll tell you really what drives us and what sets us apart is the thing that, that, that helps us is that we have such a strong core in Bible classes. Uh, all of our, our degrees come out with a major in Bible, which means 42 of your 128 credit hours are in Bible. If you go into our preaching program, it's 47 of your 128, which means this. Our grads, when they come out of school, they know the Word of God. They don't know everything about it because, let's be honest, we are all still growing in the Word of God. But, but you have had tons and hours and hours and hours of, of uh, training in understanding the Word of God, of wrestling through what it is. Is. And so let me just highlight a, a few places where our students go after graduation. We obviously have a number of students who go into lead roles like what James is doing and uh, youth pastors like what Zach is doing. We have children's pastors, worship pastors, discipleship pastors, missionaries. Uh, we have chaplains, uh, camp managers, teachers, both public and private uh, come out of our grads as well as a number of counselors. And so we have a lot of places that people who come to our school can go and we're conserve, even though our focus is mainly on on the Bible. And, and this last year, we actually had a record number of students. This spring, uh, we had a student population of 101, which doesn't sound like a huge school, but listen, we're a niche school in what we do, right? So, so we are uh, specialized in what we do, but I just want you to see those, those, those growth numbers. Uh, new freshmen in the spring semester, 100, almost 117%. That's a spring semester. That's unheard of. Typically, you get a few uh, students in the spring. Your fall is typically the biggest, and we're on track for another record number uh, this fall again. But we are recruiting more students to get those pulpits and those ministries filled. That's what we're about. And, and I just want to encourage you this morning. Would, would you pray? Would you pray with us for, for, for one more student would you join us in, in being strategic about praying for that one person who senses that call of God on their life to go into a place like Boise Bible College to get equipped for ministry? This is a picture from two weeks ago. We had a high school conference called Preview, and there were 17 students who had committed their lives to, uh, to go into a vocational ministry. And, and we invited all those students up, and then we surrounded them, so they're buried in that crowd of students there. And we prayed over those 17 students as they were coming to Boise in this fall to be equipped for ministry. But listen, we need more than 17. We need more than 80. We need, we need 100 or 125 students a year 
if we really want to make a dent in this need that, that, that's coming. And so, so I would just ask you, would you pray for one more, and would you also just send one more? Send that one. Encourage them. Encourage the next Zach to come to a place like Boise to get equipped uh, for ministry. Well, if you want to know more, come to the luncheon after church. I hear we're having pizza. I wonder if James ordered the pizza. Is that what the whole is? Oh, he's doing it right now. So see, um, so anyways, that's what happens when you like fly across the world and come back and you're just thinking through things. But I would love to chat with you. I'll be uh, in the lobby afterwards before that. If you can't stick around, I'd love to answer any questions you might have and, uh, and just talk us uh, more about who we are and what we're doing. Well, with that said, I just want to pray and then we're going to jump into our text this morning. Well, Lord God, we just thank you for this opportunity that we have to gather together as believers, to to gather and to open up your word and to wrestle with it. And and God, we know that your word is living and active and that when we open it, when we study it, when we read it, God, that you begin to do something in our hearts and, and in our souls. And Father, I just pray that right now. Would, would you just do that? Would you prepare our hearts and our souls and our minds for how your word is going to move in us? God, if there are things that, that we need to change in our lives, if there are attitudes and behaviors that, that need to be different, God, would your spirit, through the power of your spirit, would you just convict us of that? And would you just, would you help us grow today in you that we'd be different walking out of this place, not because of anything I say, but because of what your word says? So God, we give you this time, and it's in the name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, one of the activities that my family enjoys doing is going backpacking. And I don't know if you've ever been in Northeast Oregon, but but one of the places I love going is in uh, the Willow Mountains. And this is a picture of us up near Mirror Lake, and, and Eagle Cap is kind of that mountain up in the peak. But I'll tell you, before we ever began that journey, the very first thing that I did is I bought a map. Not any map. It's a topographical map, right? Because I want to see the contour lines of the trail that we're heading on. And I also want to see which trail I need to take. And, and, and I, want to, I want to make sure that I understand the trail systems and the, the geography and the topography. So that way I can know the best route to get to where I want to go. Because ultimately, as I'm backpacking, I want to make sure that I actually get to my destination. No, so, so in this journey up to Eagle Cap a couple uh, years ago, we, we started from a trailhead called Tupan. And from Tupan, which is, is off the map on the, the top left there, that, that's not marked yet, we'll be here in a moment, we're trying to get to that red circle, which is where Mirror Lake is at. But here's the deal. Within probably a couple hundred yards of getting on that trail, the, the trail splits. And it goes right, or you can go left. And if we went right instead of left, well... Here's the deal. We'd end up somewhere we never, never intended to go. And we'd take the right trail, and, and we could think that, well, we're on the right trail, and, and all of a sudden you're going to find that, well, there's more splits in the trail, and there's more places we can go, and, and we could just keep following those. And when we're in the, in the trees, we may think we're going where we need to go, and yet we may not realize how far away we actually are from our intended destination. And, and you won't know that unless I had something in my hand to help guide me, something that we might refer to as a map. You see, it's the map that's going to tell me what trail to follow. It's going to tell me if there's a good water source or where hopefully there's a good water source. There isn't always. It's going to hopefully show me if there's a, maybe a good spot to, to camp somewhere that's maybe a little flatter than, than other places. But ultimately, a good map is going to show me the way to the destination. Now, I could look at that map, and and I could just kind of scoff at it and go, yep, nope, that map doesn't know what it's talking about. And I could throw that map to the side, and I could just go, you know what, I can throw my pack on, and I'm going to take my wife and my four kids, and we're just going to go wing it. We're just going to try to get to our destination. We're just going to see what we can make happen on our own and and just follow my feelings every time I get to a junction in the trail. And can we just be honest for a moment? People who do that typically end up lost. I mean, it's the reason why we have search and rescue crews, right? Like we we don't have those because people follow the map. We, we, We have those because oftentimes people don't follow the map. And sometimes, let's be honest, they don't always survive. Now, why do I share this with you this morning? 
I share it with you this morning because the same is true in our spiritual lives. Especially as we live in an environment that really is not conducive and supportive of our Christian culture, of our Christian beliefs and values, right? And it's, it's why we, as Christians, people who, who believe in the Word of God, who, who trust the Word of God, that we actually walk by the roadmap for life and faith with this map called the Bible. Now, the Apostle John, he, he spoke to this need for, for us to walk in the truth in his second letter in the end of the uh, New Testament. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up to 2 John. It's one page long. So if you don't know where it is, there's a wonderful thing called the table of contents at the front of the Bible. My favorite page in the entire Bible. Because some of those books you just can't find very easily, right? But, but anyways, but, but go to 2 John if you would. And we're, we'll be there in just a moment. But before we dive into the text... I need to give us some important background about the text, about who John's writing to and when he wrote it. You see, he wrote this around uh, 85 to 95 AD, and that's important for this reason. We're now in the second generation of church leaders, by and large. John is like the last remaining uh, man who, 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 who would have known Jesus. Everyone else, all the other disciples, the apostles, they're all dead. They've all been killed for their faith. John is the last remaining guy, and, and he is, is the, and well, let me put it this way, all these leaders have established other leaders in these churches to lead the local church. So it's not like you can just call a Peter, James, or, or Andrew and say, hey guys, would, would you guys come over and just help sort us this out? They're all dead. You just got John. They've already established these new leaders in, in this area which is known as Asia Minor, which would be modern-day Turkey today. And that is who John is writing to. He's writing to these churches. And really, if we're honest, they're, they're small churches, there's house churches that are popping up as people are coming to know Jesus. And what does this mean? That This context means, as we're looking at it, is that, man, there's a greater opportunity for varying theological positions to present themselves. You, you don't have the apostles to go back to and say, hey, can you clarify this for me without one of these letters that they may have had? Instead, you're like, well, I think it's this. And uh, someone else is oh, no, I think it's this. And I don't know if they're arm wrestling for it or what, but what we know is there ended up being different theological positions that were coming up in these local churches. And what John is addressing right now in this text 2,000 years ago is he's addressing the issue of cessationists who believe that Jesus was a great prophet, but he wasn't supreme Lord. And the main point of what he's going to drive home for us is this, is that we need to keep strong in the true faith, and that we, as Christians, need to maintain biblical priorities in light of those who want to bend it. So what does John do first? Well, in this text, he first exhorts us to abide in uh, the truth. In Second John, I'm just going to read verses 1 through 3. He writes this. He says, the elder to the elect lady and her children whom I love in the truth. By the way, I'm reading now the ESV translation. He goes on and says, not only I, but also all who know the truth, because the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever. Verse 3, grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son in truth and love. Now, as you're reading this with me, you're probably sitting there going, how in the world do you know John is the one who wrote this? And how do you know he wrote to churches? Because he, after all, he says, the elder to the elect lady and her children. It sounds like he's writing to a mom and some children, right? But really, it's just a terminology to, to identify that he's not writing to a specific person, but that's just a, a vernacular to be able to describe the local churches, and then he is the one who is identified as the elder, but in this text, where I really want us to focus on is a word that gets repeated not once, not twice, not three times, but four times, and it's the word truth. Four times in three verses. We probably had to stop and ask the question, what does John mean by truth? And I believe in context, what he's referring to is the gospel. In John 8, 31, we read this. So Jesus said to the Jews, who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you were truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. 
Uh, Paul wrote this in 1 Timothy 2, 3-4. It says, This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. You probably know this one pretty good. John 14, 6, where Jesus said, I am the way, and I am the, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. What sets Christians apart from the rest of the world is this truth. That Jesus is the only one who saves. No one else. Nothing else. Jesus. And Jesus alone. So let me give us this warning. Whenever we take this truth, this truth of the gospel, and we change it, we add to it, we take away from it, whatever we do, whenever we, we change it, We're really entering into dangerous waters, and we need to be cautious about that. We're going to hear about that here in a few moments from from John. But there's another word that John uses in these first three verses that I think we also need to define. So we've defined truth, but we also need to define this word abide. And this word abide, it it literally means to, to continue to be present with, which means when you pair it with the gospel... It really means, or when you pair it with truth, it means that the gospel is constantly in and through us. So ponder this with me for a moment, if you would. Do we, as a church, do we allow the truth of the gospel to be constantly in us? I, th- I think we could say, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're here on a Sunday morning to worship, right? Like, we are here to do this. But let me change it just a little bit. Can we ask it this way? As Christians, do we believe that the gospel can actually change us? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I could probably tell you stories of of different people whose lives have been changed by the power of the gospel. But let me change this question one last way, and it's a little bit more personal. How has the gospel changed you? It's really easy to look at other people, isn't it? To go, well, let me tell you about this person and how their life is changed by the gospel. Let, let, let me tell you about this person over here and, and, and how their life has been changed. But, but what about you? Sure, you, you might be able to say, man, when I was 12 years old, I gave my life to Jesus. I was baptized. My life has never been the same since then. It's probably true, but what about since then? How's your life different today than it was five years ago? What about in the last 12 months? How is your life different today from 12 months ago? What about six months ago? Three months ago? A month ago? A week ago? What about a day ago? How is your life different because of the truth of the gospel? If we really believe that the gospel is the power to save, as Paul says in Romans 1.16, then our lives need and should be different from the rest of the world. And if our lives are not different, then maybe, just maybe, we have a little bit of soul searching that we need to do. Maybe what we need to do is we need to spend more time abiding in the truth of God's word. Paul writes this in 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. This is all scripture. Let me pause for a moment. That's Genesis to Revelation. That's the entirety of the Bible. All 66 books, all scripture is breathed out by God, and it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Then the writer of Hebrews says this in Hebrews 4.12. It says, for the word of God, again, that's Genesis to Revelation, is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joint and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. I firmly believe that there's something happens in our souls when we spend time abiding in the Word of God. When we actually crack it open and we begin reading and, and we allow it to not just hit our, hit our minds and we're like, yep, I did my, 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 my task for the day. I've checked the box. I've assumed the, the information, but we allow it to, to move to our hearts. 
where all of a sudden we're going, man, do I really believe what it says? Or do I just know what it says? See, when we allow the Word of God to penetrate our minds and our hearts, it keeps us on the right path. It leads us to the right destination. Do you believe this? You know, we have to be people who don't just have some intellectual scent to the truth, but that we do what John is going to tell us to do next, which is that we walk in the truth. we got to know the truth, but we also have to walk in the truth. This is what he says back in the text in verses 4 through 6. He says, I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing to you a new commandment, but one that we have heard from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you've heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. We're commanded to walk in the truth, to, to take the word of God and to actually live it out. And can I just say, this should not be new information for us. We shouldn't be reading this for the first time of, in John's letter here and to go, oh, huh, didn't know that. And maybe we have, maybe this is new for us, but if we've been in the church for a while, if we've been reading the Bible, it ought to be a reminder of what we should be doing. After all, uh, Jesus says this in John 14, 15, he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, Jesus says, you'll keep them. Uh, John writes this in his first letter in 1 John 2, 3 through 6, he says, and by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. That'd be Jesus' commandments. That'd be all of the commandments of God. He says, whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Let me pause for a moment. Can I just say that's my least favorite verse in the entire Bible? Because there's times that I don't obey. There's times that you don't obey. Oh man, that's humbling, isn't it? But he goes on in verse 5 and says, But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. See, walking in the truth means that we are actually doing what Jesus has commanded us to do. It's in this obedience that our knowledge of the truth of the gospel it really does uh, bring conviction to our hearts, and it changes the way in which we walk and live out our lives. And as we are doing that, the gospel then gets to be heard and seen by people who desperately need to hear it. And it's not that we do it in this prideful and arrogant way, but we do it, as, as John writes, with humility and with love. And Paul writes this in Colossians 3.14. It says, above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. We are to walk in the truth with love, which is honestly us reflecting the life that Jesus lived. Now, why is it important for us to abide and to walk in the truth? This is really where it comes down, where the rubber meets the road. Because when we abide in it, in the truth, and when we walk in the truth, then we have the awareness for when someone says something that's not quite right. For when someone says something that we realize that we've just left the trail, and we're actually going somewhere that we shouldn't be going. And when we have that moment where something is said that's not quite right, what John is going to tell us to do is this, is that we need to fiercely guard the truth. As we jump back in the text, he says this in verse, starting in verse 7. He says, For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is a deceiver and the Antichrist. But watch yourself so that you may not lose what you've worked for, but may win a full reward. Verse 9. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. Verse 10, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting, for whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. 
John says right here in this text something that I think we just don't think about very much in the modern church today, and it's this, is that there are deceivers that are in the church. I think it's easy for us to think there's deceivers outside the church. Of course there's lots of deceivers out there, but he says, no, there's some who are in the church. And he calls them antichrist, and they really are those who oppose the word. And really what they do is they, they come and they bring these teachings in, in, in these ways that are clever and novel. The, the, this new idea that, oh, have you heard this? You really aren't understanding the Bible this way. You need to understand it this way. And what we have to understand is that their goal is not to progress in their understanding of the faith, but to progress beyond it. And so Paul gives us two exhortations here. He says, first off, don't be deceived by them. Know your word so you know when it happens. And then the second thing he says is don't encourage these deceivers. Don't hang out with them. Don't treat them as if they are walking with the Lord. Now, David Jackman, who's a theologian, wrote this. He says, novelty is always deceptively attractive. And false doctrine can thrive where it is promoted as progressive, advanced thinking. If you are not walking and abiding in the truth, then you won't know when a claimed truth is not a truth at all. And as a pastor serving in local churches for 18 years, I can tell you that I've seen this firsthand. This isn't just some idea that existed 2,000 years ago and today it doesn't exist, but I've I've seen this attractive and novel thinking that that has led senior pastors down a road that ultimately destroyed a church. I I can think about a moment in a church that I'd served in where we had an elder who who was bought into some of these novel teachings that were so attractive and felt so right, but ultimately weren't right at all. What John is is writing to us, it's not some fairy tale. It's still something that's alive today. And you spend enough time in the church, and you're eventually going to see it. Not that we want it, but it's just reality. Now, John wraps up his his letter rather abruptly with with his final greeting, and he writes this just in verses 12 and 13. He says, Though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk to you face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your like sister greet you. So like any good pastor, he, he's like, listen, I don't want to write because it takes too much time. I'd rather just come talk. It's much easier. Well, I don't know if that was. But I mean, think about it. Sometimes you give a pastor a microphone. What does he do? Don't answer that. <laughs> we all do it as pastors, Right? But, but there's something to be said. He's just like, listen, I've told you what I need to tell you, but I want to come and talk to you more. This is important for me to get to you. I need to exhort you. I want to encourage you face to face, which means he hasn't solved all the issues that they are dealing with. He's just kind of hit it at a high level. Beware. Be cautious. You need to abide in the truth. You need to walk in the truth. And you need to fiercely guard the truth. These are the same things that we need to hear today. And you may be sitting here today going, but, but I'm not in church leadership. Why does it matter? I'm not a pastor of a church. Someone else can deal with it. I would tell you that we need to abide in the truth, walk in the truth, and fiercely guard the truth because it's hitting us all. And where it's hitting us is actually in our homes. As parents and grandparents, it is so easy to be swayed by the theology that your kids and grandkids will bring into your living rooms. And I've seen it happen over and over again where, where a student grows up in a youth ministry and, and understands the truth of God's word and, and is convicted by the truth of God's word. And all of a sudden something happens in their life in a relationship with someone else. And all of a sudden their theology changes overnight. And what I've seen is this, is that is that parents and grandparents, for the sake of relationship, give up on their theological convictions. If 
for the sake of having that relationship with their son or their daughter or their, their granddaughter or their grandson, maybe it's a neighbor, a friend, a coworker, whoever it might be, is that we give up on biblical truth so we can remain friends today. And can I just urge you this morning, don't get distracted by these clever theological positions that bend the truth of God's word. Be committed to walking the path that God calls us to be on. Don't try to take some shortcut thinking you're getting to the destination faster than anyone else. If something feels off, hit pause, research it, and figure out why. Figure out what the truth is, and then live by that truth even, and this is the hard part, even if it means that others are going to reject you. Even if it means that that son or that daughter is going to walk away from you and cut you off. Even if it means that that grandchild is going to say, so long, grandma and grandpa, don't need you anymore. See, our hope isn't that people would reject us. Our hope and our prayer really should be that, that as we speak truth to people in love, as Jesus did, that'll, actually people, that'll bring people back onto the path that Jesus intends for us to be on. If people choose not to be on that path, that's their decision. We're called to exhort, to encourage, to love, and invite people to be on that path with us, on the path that leads to eternal life. See, when we abide in this truth, we can walk in the truth. And when we walk in this truth, then we get to reflect this truth to a culture, maybe even a family, who desperately needs to hear it. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we just thank you again for today. We, we thank you for this time that we've had to, to wrestle with your word. And God, I just pray for those right now who, who are wrestling with maybe a, a relationship that they have said yes to, and in light of that, they have said no to following your word. And God, if that has happened, would, would you just pour your grace out on them right now? Would, would, you, would you just guide them back to walking in the truth? And God, in that, would you also just give them wisdom and discernment on how to engage in those relationships and those conversations? God, none of that is going to be easy. And without you, it's going to be really, really hard. So God, I just pray that you would, that you would guide these people in the relationships that they, that they may be battling in as they stand on your word. God, give them the tenacity, give them the passion, the conviction to not waver on you. God, we thank you for this time. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.